To a casual observer, this section of Southern California's rugged San Jacinto Mountains looks like a typical remote mountain retreat. But a closer look reveals something different. Somebody is watching. Solar panels cover the roof of the rustic lodge. Embedded sensors are scattered across the landscape. The animals' movements are being tracked. A robot moves slowly through the forest canopy. Computer programs calculate the current fire danger. Why are these woods wired? Is this an intelligence agency's experiment? Or some mad scientist's lair? Well, scientists are involved, but they're not really mad. Just curious. Extremely curious. Welcome to the fascinating world of the James San Jacinto Mountains Reserve, part of the University of California's Natural Reserve System, where high technology is providing scientists and students with new insights into the natural world. The reserve is located about 100 miles east of Los Angeles and was established in 1965. But even before that, the area played a key role in raising California's environmental awareness. Harry and Grace James, who donated the property to the university, were passionate educators. Dr. Michael Hamilton is the reserve manager. The Jameses are a very interesting family. They uh, ran a private school for boys called the Trailfinder School uh, out of Pasadena and later Altadena from 1925 until 1950. It was a year-round residential school for uh, children roughly um, in the sixth through the ninth grade. And uh, the student body were, was recruited from families, prominent families in California, uh, as well as from uh, families on the Hopi Reservation in Arizona, because Harry had a, a strong connection with, with uh, several Native American groups, both in California and in Arizona. And so this very unique combination of students, young students, uh, learning about natural environments, outdoor history, um, Western culture, um, included taking them to natural areas all over the Southwest. And so um, uh, many of the students grew up uh, learning about the importance of natural environments. And when they became adults and went on their way, they, their values were influenced by those early teachings of Harry, Harry and Grace. And some of those folks happened to be regents of the university and faculty and, and folks who uh, were very strong supporters of the reserve system. So the James really has had an influence on our reserves going way back before they donated this land. And, and since then, it's been one of the busiest and, and most important teaching reserves in our natural reserve system. Though the reserve itself is less than 30 acres, its unique characteristics and location make it invaluable for all types of classes, from university-level field courses to elementary school field trips. The use for the reserve varies from um, really specific research, let's say on a certain plant, to general ecology classes. A lot of our user groups are from the University of California system, but we also have other universities that use the reserve, such as Cal State University, Pepperdine, private colleges. In, in a very small area, literally within a single 500-acre watershed, you have a microcosm of diversity that uh, occurs over thousands of acres here in the San Jacinto Mountain Range. And that makes it very efficient to study um, you know, microclimate, uh, microenvironments, microecological relationships within a lot of different species. Um, just in our one-mile walk, we've We've spanned uh, chaparral, montane chaparral uh, that's less than 30 years old to old growth coniferous forests where the average tree is 200 years old. And that is so easy. You can set up experiments to do plots and comparisons across those, that micro landscape. Um, you can also, by basing yourself at the James Reserve, be able, within a, an hour drive, be in Colorado desert or be in subalpine forest. And that that increasingly wide range of ecosystems is very hard, very difficult, if not impossible to do in many other locations in California. So uh, to have that, that larger biogeography 
within almost an arm's reach. Certainly a short drive's reach is, uh, is very unique and, and what makes the James sort of the, the center of the Palms to Pines transect as it's often called by faculty. These qualities also attract a wide range of researchers to the reserve. There's a lot of rare species here, a lot of unique ec ecological um, uh, settings that um, provide for comparisons and, and, and with a high level of accessibility to it. So um, our study, long-term studies of California spotted owl, of mountain yellow-legged frog, now are becoming extremely important to the management and protection of these species in California. Without the knowledge gained from studies like those t that were that were um, investigated here, we wouldn't know as much about these species and we wouldn't be able to make the kinds of recommendations that we are now making in order to preserve them. So in a sense, conservation biology has played a big role in, in uh, putting the James Reserve on the map. I like to say that the, the single most uh, uh, important research uh, finding of the James Reserve uh, that, that's created a global community has been the discovery uh, by John Moore of a species of fruit fly back in the, actually in, he collected it in the late 50s, early 60s, and that that species, uh, Drosophila pseudo-obscura, has been collected and brought into genetics laboratories around the world and been used in the studies of, of genetics that have become critical to our knowledge of genetics and, and ultimately of genomics. Um, and so every year I'll have visitors from you know, the, the UK or from the University of Chicago or from you know, the University of Sussex uh, to collect the wild type of Drosophila to bring into the lab where they have, you know, literally they know the major genome of, the, of this fruit fly. So the James Reserve is the place to get Drosophila pseudo-obscura to find John Moore's original, original organisms. So uh, that's made it very, very interesting. Hamilton has been the manager of the James Reserve since 1982. He has spent much of that time exploring how technology can be used to study the environment. One major focus of his work has been in seeking ways to reduce the impact of wildfires on mountain communities, both human and natural. In many ways, the James Reserve mirrors other Southern California areas that were devastated by wildfires in 2003. Drought and insect infestations have killed many of the trees, while fire suppression efforts have interrupted the natural fire regime, leading to a dramatic buildup in the fuel load. Quite a bit of the research at the James Reserve over the past 20 years has been in the field of fire ecology. And that's primarily because this place has burned, both in recent times and in historic times. And it makes for some very interesting comparisons across ecosystems. Um, we're standing right on the edge or the boundary of a major fire that burned in 1974 called the Saboba Fire. It was a 17,000 acre fire that began at the bottom of the hill near Hemet and quickly burned up slope and in fact burned all the way to the top of the Black Mountain, uh, backside of Black Mountain at nearly 8,000 feet. Um, burned along the edge of the James Reserve and if it wasn't for a uh, backfire that was set downslope from here that lightly burned into the understory, uh, this fire would have swept down into the canyon and probably caused uh, a lot of mortality in the conifer forests. Um, but as such, it didn't, and so it provides us very easy access from the reserve to a boundary where we have different uh, intensities of fire and different ages of fire in the past. So along this area here, you're looking at um, primarily shrub vegetation, these are Ceanothus and Manzanita, which are f fire response species. They regenerate rapidly after fire and they grow vigorously for about 30 years. Um, in the un beneath those shrubs, within a five years of a fire, um, the conifers begin regenerating again, primarily coulter pines. And they're very rapidly growing pines, so they grow up, up and through the shrubs. And so there are already a number of 30-year-old uh, coulter pines growing in here and this would be the beginning of a replacement forest if fire did not return to this ecosystem. But the fact of the matter is this fire is frequent in these at, in Southern California mountains due to lightning and due to human caused sources. Um, and in fact when you look at historic fires or prehistoric fires um, which we, we can understand by looking at scars on trees and looking at areas that have not 
been managed for, uh, against wildfires, such as down in Mexico, we see that, wild, that fires in this ecosystem probably occurred every three to four years, uh, significant ground fires. And those ground fires controlled the understory regeneration of many of these species. So seedlings of conifers, seedlings of oaks, seedlings of shrubs would be burned and many of them would be killed by these low intensity ground fires but they were fires that would not have any major impact on the large overstory. So big trees and middle-sized trees or middle-sized cl class of trees would persist or survive these low intensity fires and actually flourish. Um, however, in the last 120 years, fire control or fire suppression of fire by our national forest has um, allowed for that regeneration class to not be uh, kicked back, pushed back by natural fire, but in fact to survive and almost all of the understory regenerates. And as a result, we have a very thick and very dense under and middle story of, of all of the species that are growing at densities that we never see in some of the, the uh, forests that have natural fire on a regular basis. So research at the James on fire ecology has been very, a very interesting comparison of fires locally and fires down in Mexico. And we've had uh, several different researchers over the past few years who have made comparative studies between the, the Sierra San Pedro Martir Mountains in Mexico and the San Jacinto Mountains, which are the same mountain range. They're just a couple of hundred miles difference in latitude, but very different fire management prescriptions, and as a result, a very different uh, physical structure of the forest. Hamilton's close observations in the field, combined with his interest in computer technology, have led to new strategies for predicting fires and reducing the damage they cause. I have a graduate student who very specifically is involved in building virtual worlds um, that are of different scenarios of pre-fire, post-fire, and fire risk relationships. Um, we are able to take ground level information and integrate it with uh, remote sensing data to create these models that show the fire, the relative fire danger and fire risk. Um, here's just an example of a series of our products. Uh, we can start with, with panoramic photography of a location and then using um, uh, three dimensional photogrammetry software we can render it into 3D objects or 3D shapes of the individual trees and, and objects in the scene. Um, those in turn can be uh, combined with 3D representations of the herbaceous layer, of the taller trees, of the middle story, of the snags and the dead wood components. And all of these figure into calculating just how flammable an ecosystem is and how, how it's likely to uh, change through time. These are three-dimensional views, but now we've animated the change in plant growth over time. So this is a model of plant succession over about a 100-year period of time from after a fire and then until the point where the trees have grown are ready to burn again. Here's a, here's a patch showing a prescribed burn. But again, this is all simulated. It's based on a computer program uh, telling us where a fire might burn and then creating a, a, a realistic view of that fire uh, it, after it would it potentially would have happened. And our fire uh, models have been applied to the local communities of Idlewild to uh, give property owners an idea of just how relatively risky their property is in terms of potential for fire and, and how hot that fire might be if it were to burn on their property. And that's based on using our remote sensing data and uh, building up those samples uh, that were taken uh, throughout the different ecosystems. So in this, this is an example of us using science to develop information systems that then can be used by local land management agency uh, decision makers in deciding where they should put, best put their money for fire prevention, fire protection. Another major focus at the James Reserve has been in using cameras and other sensors to record natural phenomena and then make it available to scientists and the public over the internet. 
So what you're seeing is part of a project that we began about two and a half years ago to develop um, a virtual presence on some of the natural phenomena that occur here at the reserve. What I mean by virtual presence is using the internet to connect live cameras and data collection devices to our local area network and then make that available through a server over the internet. And the impetus for this project was a science education study that was has been conducted here by Kathleen Metz from UC Berkeley um, to involve very young children in, in inquiry-based science education. And one of the issues in K-12 uh, science education is that you're basically, kids are spending most of the time in their classroom um, and very little time being able to take field trips and be able to explore, you know, the real world outside of their school. Yet for hands-on exploratory science, you know, it's imperative you go out into the field. Um, and so, generally speaking, uh, you know, a class might take one or two field trips a year and that's it for their exposure to the real world. Um, so what we're trying to do with this project is to bring aspects of that real hands-on science into the classroom, but in a way that's very realistic uh, and using the internet as that, as that vehicle for bringing the information. So uh, we began first by developing a, uh, a camera, a single camera on a hummingbird feeder. So at a hummingbird feeder, you can observe interactions between the birds. You can measure things like how often they feed, what time of the day, how is temperature and environment influence when they feed. Um, we began with the, with the hummingbird feeder, and then we expanded it to include other uh, feeder types. We're interested in how different species interact with one another, and the only way you can do that is by watching them. You can also... Um, uh, using panoramic photography, gain an idea of what the outside surrounding environment is like at the feeder. And we do that using a robotically controlled camera that we uh, call the RoboCam. The RoboCam is a motorized camera mount located on the top of our weather station tower, which allows you to um, physically control the, the um, uh, angle both in horizontal and vertically, and the zoom factor of a camera in real time. So the general public watches the webcams as well as students, um, professors, us here. We've made several observations through webcams. This year we got to observe through that camera in the nest box an entire nesting process of a violet green swallow, which is hard to get. The all the, the times and all the phases of the nest. Um, when you're manually checking the nest, you're disturbing the animals. Um, with a camera, you, you don't even need to go to the box. You can observe everything through the camera. And this camera records 24 hours a day since it's infrared. So we were able to see activity night and day. That, to me, was um, just a great um, observation that we made this summer in, in getting that entire nesting process on the violet green swallow. Um, if you look in several of the field guides or ornithology books, you'll see that ornithologists or birders have a hard time getting that accurate information. How long did it take for, you know, the eggs to hatch? Or from hatching, how long did it take the chicks to fledge the box? And so that, I, I think that was probably a great accomplishment with the webcams. The webcams at the reserve are also used by classes in local area grade schools. We currently have a, um, a K through third grade um, curriculum set up. In their classrooms, um, in Hemet and in Idlewild, they will watch our webcams over the internet in their classrooms and learn about really basic science, basic bird behavior or mammal behavior. So the teachers are designing a curriculum around the webcams. The use of sensors at the reserve expanded dramatically in 2002 when UCLA, UC Riverside, and a number of other universities received a major grant from the National Science Foundation to establish SENS, the Center for Embedded Network Sensing. The James Reserve is a major testing ground for these networks. This partnership is ideal. Engineers have the opportunity to develop and test their system in a natural environment, while biologists benefit from unprecedented amounts of data on the environmental microclimates that drive the local ecology. Mike Wimbro is the SENS project engineer at the James Reserve. What's exciting about the technology here is that everything is new. 
Uh, we're working with, with new software, we're working with uh, new configurations of hardware. The, the quantities that we're sensing are new uh, from a biologist's point of view to be able to have that much data and uh, that distributed a system. So every piece of it's new and all of it has a positive impact in what we can measure and, uh, and learn about our environment here. The system architecture we use in the SENS project has several different layers in it and components that get data from the outside world into our servers here in the server room. The first step is this sensor integrated circuit board here that we call a MICA and uh, we hook up different kinds of sensors. This is one of the smaller ones which is a light sensor uh, called a uh, PAR sensor. And we use it to detect light that's useful to plants and uh, it, it's connected here. Larger ones are like this uh, humidity gauge. They're all wired up uh, to this sensor node here which measures the values uh, periodically right now about every five minutes and transmits those values to the next neighbor of one of these things. We'll have uh, 20 or 30 of these in the field and eventually the signal hops from one to the next to the next until it gets to uh, one that's close enough to transmit back to one of our micro server uh, systems. The micro server system is one right here which has a, a small uh, handheld device and another one of these radio communication devices. This one's hooked up with some wires to a large antenna outside so we get a wider range. Processing goes on on this computer which translates the raw values from the field into finished values of actual percentages of relative humidity instead of voltage. Those are then sent uh, through either a wireless connector or, or a wired network uh, into our servers right here in the server room. Mike Taggart installs and maintains the equipment in the field. Each MICA can contain a range of sensors depending on what it is monitoring. This is a microclimate weather station. Um, inside the housing we have a, a MICA and a sensor board as well as a sensor to measure inside temperature and inside humidity. Both of those are important to let us know if the electronics are overheating or if moisture has somehow crept into the housing. In addition, we capture outside temperature and humidity within this structure, and we also capture leaf wetness over here, which uh, this thing uh, lets you know when there's uh, condensation happening. We have a rain bucket, a very traditional weather instrument for uh, letting us know how much it's raining. And we have an anemometer and a wind direction indicator. So this little thing right here will give us all of the local weather for this area. This is a woodland area. We also have very similar structures with very similar instrumentation in other types of uh, microclimates as well. Sensors are also being installed in bird boxes throughout the reserve. Well, these, these boxes have a very interesting story because uh, there are probably two dozen different designs to choose from when building a, a bird box. The, this particular one is for the mountain bluebird. Uh, some, of the, some of the subtleties of this one, uh, we needed a way to mount our sensors inside. So we, uh, uh, we uh, built this shelf here and uh, we put Lexane glass on it in addition to all of the sensors that it's equipped with. Um, the glass is there so that we can uh, later on mount a camera in here and be able to take pictures real time as we're gathering the data so we can see what's happening in the nest as the data is being gathered. Um, some of the other more subtle things about the box, um, most bird boxes you don't care about moisture getting inside. This one um, we care deeply because we have all these electronics inside so we had to end up actually putting a roof on it which uh, you'll find uh, not too many bird boxes with, uh, with shingles. Um, another subtlety, the, uh, the uh, protective guard here the entire box is made from cedar, which has a lot of characteristics which uh, work for a birdhouse. Um, one of the things about cedar is that it's a soft wood. Uh, because of that, you need to put a hardwood, for instance oak here, to keep other types of birds from going into the nest. Um, the, the actual diameter of the hole is critical to the type of bird that you're trying to get to nest in the box. So you don't want other birds coming along and expanding the size of the hole. So some people use plastic, but we choose to use oak to keep it natural. <laughs> like all the electronics inside. 
in a, in a box like this, we end up with uh, a humidity and temperature sensor in the uh, outside here. And then on the inside of the box, um, we end up with uh, a humidity and temperature for the inside of the bird box, as well as uh, an infrared sensor to let us know when there is a bird in the box. Um, so, you know, this, and then we have a switch here to, to, to allow us to test the thing when we're in the field. So, um, on, a, on a relatively simple box like this, we end up with uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, at least six sensors. Uh, we also have a sensor for sunlight externally, so that gets us up to seven pretty quickly. So, for each mica we have in the field, uh, we have it censored in different ways depending on the application. Each of the micas um, has an antenna on it, and it tries to talk to the other micas. And whoever it can find in its general area, it communicates all of the information that it has gathered. And then um, all of the information eventually makes it back to the microserver, uh, where it's uh, further relayed through the internet uh, to UCLA and to a local database here. The SENS project promises a new era in field biology. Most of us in field stations are involved with uh, remote sensing and, and looking at the landscape in terms of spatial interrelationships. Um, but what's been lacking is the information at the ground level and at scales that go much smaller than anything in remote sensing is able to give to, give to us. So um, sort of the state of the art in remote sensing is meter square resolution of canopies and, and ground phenomena from above. But uh, the sensor network gives us sort of the same capability of, of collecting data over lots of pixels on the ground, um, but at scales that go down to micron scale, um, or certainly below the scale of most organisms. Um, so we can integrate you know, in a, in a multi-scale context up from, from molecules to um, uh, patterns of the landscape. And that's unprecedented in ecology to be able to have the power of real-time data uh, across those multiple scales. So we suspect new science will really be generated from these systems. It's, it's, a, it's a whole new instrumentation approach that uh, up to now has been unaffordable or really impossible due to the technology constraints. Um, so it's just going to break open, a, I think, a dam in terms of, uh, of new possibilities for, for ecology and environmental science. The James Reserve is just one of the 35 sites in the University of California's Natural Reserve System. Each site provides a protected environment where scientists can conduct groundbreaking research and students can learn about the natural world firsthand. From these efforts, all Californians will benefit as we expand our understanding and appreciation of the world around us, thanks to these living laboratories.